and everybody expected the opposition to be clobbered. And instead, the government was routed, and the opposition came to power. And it was very exciting. And it has often been said that the work which Maurice and others did in softening up the culture and attempting to change attitudes and working on all these fronts simultaneously helped to deliver a blow to the outgoing party, which were, uh, you know, their attitudes around, around uh, issues of, of men who have sex with men and sex workers and injecting drug users. The attitudes were crypto-fascist, frankly. They were just absolutely unacceptable in every respect. So that felt extremely good. So we had the women's agency, we had sexual violence, we have uh, questions of uh, homophobia, which we're hoping to uh, introduce that particular two-pronged strategy into some countries in Africa where the anti-homosexuality stuff is running riot. And then number four, don't worry, it ends at 41. Um, <laughs> number, uh, number four, is the question of disabilities. One of the most upsetting things when I was the envoy for HIV AIDS in Africa is the people, the disabled who would come to you, deaf, blind, wheelchair bound, desperate for some protection because they were so vulnerable to sexual violence. And nobody responded. Uh, I mean, they were on the margins of the margins. They were the vulnerable group who was always seen as expendable. And, and I have to say that I didn't respond. I mean, I, uh, to this day, I can't forgive myself. Uh, you know, we were, we were at the time, I make the rationalization, it has some legitimacy. At the time, we were so consumed by death everywhere. Everywhere you turned, people were dying. Countries were graveyards. The only businesses that were flourishing were funeral parlors. I was, it was just awful. So segmenting specific groups in the population, responding to them, I just didn't get around to it. But, but when the envoy ended, my colleagues and I determined that, that we would, by God, we would deal with this question of disabilities. So at the International AIDS Conference in, uh, in Mexico City in 2008, we had a town hall uh, bringing disabled people from around the world and a number of other people involved in AIDS. And we managed to work on the intersection of AIDS and disabilities. We, we, we don't assume that these, these changes will emancipate situations. I mean, if you get rid of the homosexuality, the sodomy laws in Jamaica, that's just the first step to creating a, a, a free and, and, and open society for LGBT populations. You've got to reach the stage where the President of the United States talks comfortably about gay marriage, and then, and then, and then you know, exactly. <laughs> then, then, you, then you know you're making some uh, progress. It takes time. But on disabilities, we had a tremendous open forum. It was, it was, uh, it was quite uh, inspiredly moderated by a young fellow named Avi Lewis. Um, uh, uh, nepotism in my family knows no limits, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely no limits. Uh, uh, and, and it made quite an impact. But what somebody realized, or many people realized at the time, was that there, 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 there weren't even ramps to get people onto the stage. You, you had to lift wheelchairs or have people in wheelchairs speaking from the, from the floor rather than the platform. And, and, and the sign language interpretation, which had to be very sophisticated because the sign language is often different in Kenya, Mexico, the United States, uh, American Sign Language is not universal. So there was a lot of orchestration involved. We didn't pull it off. But in Vienna in 2010, we had a couple of major sessions on AIDS and disabilities and had made tremendous advances to the credit of the International AIDS Society on all of the access questions. And then this year, at the International AIDS Conference in Washington, uh, we're going even further. We are having a whole day session on the eve of the International AIDS Conference, bringing in young disabled people for a whole day session on advocacy, on how they can advance their own uh, positions. We're holding it at Gallaudet University for the Deaf, which is a wonderful uh, facility in Washington. And then the young disabled people, men and women, will be uh, integrated into the conference, the convention itself, in a way which gives them the kind of equal status and equal voice 
that they haven't had before. And these things, as I say, they always take time, but it is so refreshing when you make some progress. And then finally, on, on this side of things, just to show you what preoccupies us, um, we're, uh, we're working on something called, and this is particularly, we have, we have three lawyers in our little 10 or 11 person group, never, never go beyond 25%, but, but, <laughs> but, 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 but you can live with 25%, uh, sort of. Uh, uh, and, and we have a number of, uh, I mean, uh, AIDS Free World is an avowedly unabashed feminist organization. We work on a feminist analysis. We work most strongly around uh, women and women's issues. And we started to work on vertical transmission. That is the transmission of the virus from mother to child during pregnancy, birth, or breastfeeding. And again, my co-director and colleagues with her were aghast at the claims that were being made by the United Nations agencies and the inadequate nature of the responses and the sometimes reckless nature of the responses. So on three separate occasions now, we have backed the United Nations into a corner such the WHO, UNAIDS, and UNICEF have had to withdraw initiatives they've taken because the initiatives imperiled the life of the mother or the child, or the initiatives were poorly fashioned or designed, or the initiatives required significant amendment before they should be applied. And, and, I, and I say that with some pride because nobody takes on the United Nations. You know, it's sacrosanct. You dare not criticize the agencies, but we love taking on the agencies. Uh, we're, we are experts in alienation. Um, I, 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 I think it's probably fair to say that we don't have a friend left in the, entire, in, 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 in the entire UN system, and if possible, by the end, we won't have a friend left on the planet. Uh, and, and we don't care. Well, I haven't talked to Chris about it, but they're not Chris cares. But, but we, we, we are determined when we, when we see an issue to engage in the advocacy that can uh, make it uh, surrender. And all of these areas are tremendously important because they involve, fundamentally, they involve human survival. And I've, I've learned that one should never give up. One, one should understand, you know, you... You, you, you wake up one morning, as, uh, as Jack did, and you have 103 seats. I mean, it's, it's phenomenal when you are tenacious and determined and principled. What can happen as the pendulum swings? So I'm, I'm, I'm filled with kind of spirited uh, enthusiasm about the struggles in this world. You get, you get beaten up, you get, you get bashed, you... You, uh, you, 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 you lose many of them, but you grit your teeth and you keep on fighting. And sometimes it becomes perilous, ominous, and deeply important that we mount the battle. I did, I did want to give you a sense of, of the advocacy that I'm engaged in at the moment, but more important, the way in which advocacy can bring hope and life to people, the way in which it can be undaunted, the way in which, if principled and uncompromising, it can actually move things forward. And one should never be oppressed or depressed by the occasional defeat. Just be enlivened by it. When you're defeated, grit your teeth and take it forward. Thank you for having me.